So I'm just going to go through my 26 month experience with this thing. There have been several devices in my lifetime that have changed the way I've been able to manage patients. Uh, one is experience, of course. I think knowledge and experience are good. The other was the iliosacral screw and the fluoro in the operating room. I would say that the other thing that's really changed my practice has been uh, this device because I think it allows me to know things that I really have wanted to know for a long time. Let's just do an example. This is an acetabular injury. You can see it's a fracture dislocation. You can see he's had some attempt at a closed reduction. This is his transverse component. This is his intact dome. This is the displaced wall. Looks like this on a 3D. You can see the wall is in several components. You can see the transverse displacement. And on a CT scan, you can see there's not a lot of dome for the head to stay on. And for that reason, he continues to be dislocated or subluxed for sure, subluxated away from the intact dome. This is the preoperative scan. In the operating room, we decide that we're going to do a Coker Langenbeck and we turn him prone. And when we put the C arm on him, it looks like this. Now he's reduced. He's been relaxed, he's been put prone. Now the head is beneath the intact dome and I don't know what just happened because I know there was an attempt at reduction, it didn't work. And now just by relaxing him and putting him prone, he's reduced and I don't know if there's debris in the joint now. I don't know all these things, but I can make the machine go and by making the machine go, and I, I think you've seen some of the images, but this is just the action of the machine just so you'll see and this is about how long it takes. I can bring the machine in now that his joint is in a different place than the preoperative CT scan. I had a preoperative CT scan. He was just dislocated when it was obtained. And this is about as long as it takes. Now the anesthesiologist, she's offered the opportunity to leave the room if she'd like to, but when I get the images in the operating room, they look like this, and this is just real time. And I can look over at the monitor and I can see that image and I can see these images. Now I can see the head is reduced. I can see the extent of the wall, no debris. The head's got a little bit of an impaction injury to it. And now I have real-time information of what's happening with my patient right now. And I can go through the operation with this information. I can clamp the transverse, reduce the wall, put the wires in, secure the transverse with an anti-grade screw, fix the wall, put the plates on. Now do, do I have this thing well reduced? Uh, is the transverse still off a little bit? Is the, are the plates located well? Are the screws in the plates in the bone right? I, I, don't, I don't know all those things. I hope so. I sure hope so. But as you know, hope is a pretty pathetic surgical tactic. So I can put this um, and pack the wound. This is our patient. You can see he's prone still. We pack the wound. We shroud up the patient. And then I can go over to the monitor. I can scrub out. I don't have to scrub out, but I like to scrub out and just go look at it. And I can see if my reduction's good or my plate's in a good spot. Is my integrate screw, that Ramus screw good? Did I get all the debris out? Do I have the plates located on the wall right? Is the reduction okay? Did I bring up the marginal impaction? Is the bone graft sufficient? And are my screws safe? Maybe you can come up with a lot of other questions that you have in the operating room, but I can solve that. This is my post-operative, or this is the intraoperative imaging. That's the post-operative CT scan. So I can, uh, as you know, Professor Yostin has already told you this gives you things that you can see that allows you to know the things that you'd like to know. It takes about a minute to pack the wound, another minute to shroud up and put the sheets on. You come in with a collision check. That takes, depending on who the x-ray tech is, it takes anywhere from one to two minutes. They're very experienced x-ray tech. This is our crew, and I, I, I just cannot emphasize enough uh, 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 the, the knowledge of the crew. These are our x-ray techs, and they really, uh, they really make this uh, what could be a complicated procedure, not so complicated. How about an associated both column example just for, uh, to go to the acetabulum? The preoperative CT scan shows the amount of dome on the anterior column and where the posterior column meets and what the serrations are like. You can plan where to put the clamp how you want to. We can use this as a teaching tool in the operating room. This is the 3D and then we can get the, this is just the image in the operating room, the AP of the hip, and we can ghost the two on. So you can use this to help people understand what they're dealing with. We can do the reduction, do the fixation, and then we can get the spin to make sure that we have the reduction that we want before we close the wound and finish. Look at the Zeem intraoperative image on the left and look at the AP film that we got in the OR. This is in the operating room with the patient on the bed postoperatively. I would say that the, the Zeem image is better quality. I haven't manipulated these. <laughs> I, didn't, I didn't gray up the, uh, the, the, the one on the right. And then here's the CT scan quality compared to the Zeme, as you saw from Professor Yostin. How about this is the one that I showed you earlier with the posterior wall. This is the uh, incomplete anterior column associated both column injury with a large uh, posterior wall. Not an uncommon scenario. 
But again, do we need to do a separate approach for this posterior wall? Should we do an extended ileofemoral? Do we do sequentials or can we get it all from just an ilioinguinal? The asterisk is on the wall component. We can restore the columns, put the lines back together, restore the, the teardrop, and then we can attack this wall in a lot of different ways. We can clamp the wall, screw the wall, and then spin to make sure that we got it the way we want to. Well, the reduction's pretty good, but you can see we've completely missed the wall with my screws. I did this case about a year and a half ago. This is not in 1991 when I was trying to just figure out where the wall was when I was in the front. I think I pretty much know where the wall is, but clearly on this patient, as Professor Yostin told you, I can now stop, reassess my life, try to understand better where the wall is, figure out what mistake I made when I was trying to put screws into it, re-put the clamp back on, redirect the screws more posteriorly, and then if I want to spin the patient, I can reassess the reduction and see that now all of my screws are in the wall and I have sufficient fixation. You say, well, maybe you don't even need that fixation, then why did we do it? So I think we can always justify away our mistakes. We are all surgeons and we're really good at justifying away our mistakes, but one of the things that helps us with this is this, this, this device, this tool, this imaging device allows us to, it makes it a little bit harder to justify away your mistakes because now you have the ability to see what you've done. If I had found this on a post-operative CT scan, I'm, I don't know what I would have done. I don't know if I would have operated them or not, but in the operating room I can just go ahead and correct it. Same with debris. How many of you have tried to take debris out of a hip joint doing an acetabular fracture and you sort of think you've got all the debris out of the fossa? This will allow you after you fixed it to make sure you've got it out of the fossa. You can see we didn't get it right. We still have debris in the fossa. We can stop, take the fixation apart, get the debris out. Here's another use I think is really good, not so much for the preoperative CT scan but the intraoperative abilities. This is a patient that looks like this. You can see she's got transverse fracture as well. You can see the displacement of the head. Yellow is the dome. But look at her. Can you see her? Look at her. Let me help you look at her better. This is her. So Dr. Taylor's in the back there, and he and I managed a patient a couple of weeks before this patient, maybe about two months before this patient. And I'll just ask you if you can identify this. Is this the axilla? Is it a buttock? It's where the belly meets the thigh? Is that the knee? Is that the chest? Where is that? There you go. So some of you got it right, maybe all of you got it right, but there's a Coker-Langenbeck incision if you want to, and about, so this is our patient that I just showed you, and that's her getting ready for her Coker-Langenbeck, but I remember this patient from two or three months earlier, and I remember the, Dr. Taylor, how many operations does this patient have? 12? Just to try to get this under control. So you can change. You can see the yellow marks would be the percutaneous fixation. This reduction looks pretty good to me in this gal. And so we convert or make our decision to go ahead and do percutaneous. Now we've adjusted what we've done as a result of the patient's body habitus. And maybe you say that's a bad thing, but I can just tell you that sometimes when you don't, that's a bad thing too. Then I can use the imaging to make sure that the reduction is sufficient and that my implant accuracy is what I think it is. Femoral head fracture dislocations. At the op end of the operation, you can Check them, you can see the yellow marker is where the wound is packed and this just checks to make sure that I like the femoral head reduction and I like the location and the depth of the screws and they're not sticking out the back and that the wall is intact. This is an interesting patient. He was in a motorcycle accident and he has what we thought to be an irreducible injury on the right side of femoral head fracture dislocation. His left side was able to be reduced in the operating, I mean in the emergency room. And so this is his follow-up film and you can see his right side's changed from there to there, and he's got what everybody thinks is an irreducible. It's a Sunday around one o'clock. We bring him to the operating room, and we put the seam on, or we look at the C arm on his left side, and then we can examine this hip. It's a smooth, stable, concentric reduction. This is a peripheral poster wall, as you can see. We choose closed reduction. We have to open reduction though, because we know the right side is irreducible. But his limbs look pretty symmetrical, and somewhere along the way, he has somehow despite the doctors trying to put it back in. We, we couldn't get it back in, but the housekeepers or whoever, the transportation orderlies, when they were rolling him and moving him around, they did the close reduction somewhere along the way. So now we have a patient in the operating room and he no longer has this, he has this. And so, of course, we can spin this, see what the femoral head reduction looks like. We can approve it, we can examine this. It's a smooth, passive, stable, congruent 
range of motion, we can tell everybody that we're not going to do the operation. We're just going to treat it closed. He had a very uneventful uh, outcome. I want to just talk to you about pelvic ring injuries, especially patients who have their imaging done in binders. You may have this experience where patients in a binder don't look like they have much of an injury at all. I would challenge most of you to think that these sacroiliac joints are injured at all on this patient. You know what's coming because at some point she's going to get her elbow, open elbow, I indeed, and she's going to have the binder taken off and in the operating room they check her pelvis and this is what she looks like in the operating room after they've done the elbow IND. Now they weren't violent with the elbow IND, they didn't do anything except just take the binder off. So she's got a previously unrecognized instability and now we've got a problem. So we can say, well, let's just put her in traction because it looks like if I just pull on that a little bit, I can get it reduced. And then I'll just pull on a little bit. That's no traction, that's traction, no traction, traction. I'm liking what I'm seeing. I think I'm doing a pretty good job with my close reduction, and so far I'm thinking about this is uh, screaming for a screw. Well, let's look at it on another direction and say, well, the left side looks pretty good, and the right side is still off a little bit, but come on, that's not so bad. But let's spin her and see what we got in traction. This is her in traction. So you can see the close reduction, the inlet and the outlet above, and then this is her spin in the operating room. This is not as reduced as we thought it was, similar to the patient we showed you with the revision surgery. We now know that we can change and go to a closed reduction, I mean an open reduction. This changes our therapeutic plan, but it changes it based on the knowledge that we have rather than a bad percutaneous procedure. And you can also see her left side now has an injury that we didn't know as well. I'll finish up just with a couple of x-rays of the ankle because I think the Zeme has great application for this as well as for assessing femoral necks and plateaus and distal femur and elbow and proximal humerus. But this is just a, a little bit of a plug for syndesmotic accuracy. You can clamp the syndesmosis sometimes, and you think it's really good on the plain films like you see on the right, but then when you spin them, you'll see that it's not really as good as you wanted it to be. It's too anterior. You can readjust the clamp, readjust the reduction, put it where it needs to be, and go ahead and fix it. This is a real advantage of the machine. Same with this, another ankle example with a syndesmotic injury. The syndesmosis is being assessed for the accuracy of the reduction. You can see the spin, we've got this. It looks like the syndesmosis is good this time. And I think this reduction is good, but you know, if you just look one more click down, you'll see there's some debris in the medial side that we didn't even know about. We kind of missed that. And so we can go ahead and take the debris out. You say, well, that's, that's not really relevant. Well, if it's your ankle, it's probably relevant. <laughs> if it's my ankle, it's probably relevant. So we can take it apart and go on and take the debris out, reassess, make sure the syndesmosis is good, and then make sure that the debridement is sufficient.